All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM joining you as usual from, I was going to say a sunny San Diego, but it's actually a rainy and gray San Diego. We don't have that very often, so I'm not going to complain. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Susan Harrow, who's just up the coast actually in San Rafael in Northern California. How are you doing, Susan? We do have a bit of sun, but it's about sunshine in the mind all the time, right? Like, and <laughs> yeah. we still have sunshine in the mind and getting ourselves prepared for any kind of circumstance, no matter what happens. I love what um, I just saw a quote by Luciano Pavarotti who said, you uh, you want to have sun in your voice. And I thought, you know what? You want to have sun in your whole being at yeah. all times, which we, yeah. we call presence or command presence, which which we know we were just talking about martial arts too, mm -hmm. where you need to have that command presence instantly before you step on the mat, really all the time. But I think to have that kind of consciousness is very difficult all the time. So we have that consciousness, right? When you and I step on sure. the mat or our different martial arts mats, mm -hmm. that we, 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 we have a different presence, right? Yeah, no, ab absolutely, absolutely. And and Susan, in, as you just referred to, is a, is a martial artist, also a media trainer, marketing strategist, and the author of Sell Yourself Without Selling Your Soul. And for over 33 years, she's trained thousands of uh, CEOs, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, solving the world's most pressing problems uh, to turn their message into money using media appearances. And what we're going to talk today is a really interesting topic. It's how to prepare for any media or podcast interview so you don't ruin your reputation and instead you grow your business and your brand. And, and I think this is a fantastic topic because as we were talking just before we came on air is... I mean, once upon a time, uh, I mean, going back, a, going back a number of years, it was it was all about media, right? It was all about getting on either getting on radio shows or getting on TV shows or get interviews or whatever, and and they were relatively hard to get. Um, so and they were and they were often like far, you know, uh, booked well in advance. So you had lots of time to prepare and all of that. But now with podcasting. Um, there's a lot more availability to get yourself online, but people are making the mistake, I think, of treating it like, well, it's only a podcast. It's not like I'm going on national TV, for, therefore I don't have to prepare as much. And I think people are getting caught out because they end up on, on podcasts and then they're kind of like a deer in the headlights. You would know, and I think that that's often super common, is that you want to prepare for a podcast the same way you would prepare for a national TV show or a national, any kind of top publication, anything, which is your time with your, the other, your audience is very valuable and it needs to be super concise. It needs about like taking war and peace and turning it into haiku. I remember one of my clients who was a speaker, you know, a lot of speakers are used to standing on the stage and speaking for 45 minutes. Yep. And it's not, you don't have that same kind of control because this is back and forth. And you want to take those 45 minutes and condense them down to 30 to 45 seconds max. But the other thing behind that, like just taking a couple steps back from that, mm -hmm. is that what we want to think about before we ever go on any podcast is like, number one is, is this a good audience for me? Is this, are these the people that I want to speak to? And before that, you're thinking about what's my deepest intention and how do I want to serve? And that kind of foundation is what's going to set the the pace for the kinds of things you're going to say. And then am I telling the kind of stories, statistics, facts, vignettes, acronyms that is going to resonate and really connect with my audience for what I want to accomplish, whether it's changing an opinion, whether it's selling a business book, product, service, or cause, what is it that you want to accomplish from being on that podcast and then reflecting, did it happen? Mm -hmm. If I wanted new clients or I wanted to shape a perception or I wanted someone to buy my book or hire me as a consultant, did it happen? I remember I was just, I was meeting some new people on LinkedIn and I was connecting with someone and saying, um, I'm, I'm speaking at a women future co conference. I'm moderating it. And I'm, I, and I said, you know, have you been doing a lot of podcasts and how's that working for your business? And some people wrote, 
I've been on 600 podcasts. And I said, how did that work for you? And they said, well, nothing happened. And I'm thinking, well, you were on 600 podcasts. Um, where was the iteration? Mm -hmm. And where was the taking a look at what's working? I know you and I, when we were talking about martial arts, it's like <laughs> when you're perfecting a technique, you want to say, well, when did I connect with my opponent? Did my opponent fall? Did I, was it graceful? Was it easeful? Was it, uh, you know, energetically in sync where it, where it was beautiful and it worked? Because if it didn't work, you want to backtrack it and say, what part of that wasn't working mm -hmm. and do that kind of iteration. And yeah. I think that, that takes a lot of training. That's the kind of practice that gets ingrained in muscle and mental memory. Yeah. And, and just an interesting point there you made though, with somebody like being on 600 podcasts and you're saying, well, what came of it? And they say nothing. But, I mean, part of it, and it's the same for media too, is, is part of it is I think sometimes people think, well, if I go on this, if I go on this, you know, TV show, or if I go on this radio show, or if I go on this podcast, they're going to do all the promotion. And I'm just going to sit back and like, get all this, you know, get all this attention. The fact is, you need to be you need to be tuned into promoting yourself, like taking that asset and, and promoting it yourself. I think two aspects of that. Um, I was training a, a workshop and there was um, a man in there who has a very successful business. You know, his business is hundreds, of, he gets hundreds of thousands of dollars in consulting. And in the middle of um, trying to, he's used to speaking on the stage. And in the middle of talking about that, he's like, you know what, this is just too hard. I don't think I can do this. And I said, well, I said, you, it's like you haven't played a tennis tournament and you expect yourself to go to Wimbledon. Mm -hmm. um, and you haven't had that kind of practice. And so, you know, it is about the practice and the iteration. And now I've forgotten your question. I know I wanted to say <laughs> that there was something that you would ask me about, like the, about, oh, the TV, about, TV. Would you about, about, about promoting it. You need to promote oh, it just yeah. as much as you're there. So that's the other thing that's changed in the media landscape today is that you're not just promoting yourself and, 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 Journalists and producers hate it when you promote yourself. So it has to be seamless. It has to be in service to the audience first. Mm -hmm. but the second part of that is you really do need to promote them. And you need to promote them by posting about it before on social media, mm -hmm. after on social media, in all of your different channels. So if not, one of one of the PR firms that I work with closely since I do the media training and the PR firm does the booking, they had somebody booked on um, Good Morning America. And when they right. saw the person's, his social media following was so small, they canceled them. Right, right, right. So, so it's not just, they don't, they, of course, it's important your engagement in social media, but, and your email newsletter list, but you want to make it sexy for them to have you on and actually be proactive in telling how you're going to help promote them. And one way to do that is to have a takeaway, but the takeaway like a PDF or an mm -hmm. audio or a video or whatever that is, but the takeaway goes on their website, not yours. So they want to drive people to their website after your appearance or before, you know, after the appearance to read the article, watch watch the show and then stay there. So if they have something to read, it's better SEO for them. And then within that document or on that website, then they link to your website. So that's another way that you can help promote them in a way that, they, that they'll love you and ask you back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the other thing too is the is is preparing yourself, but also finding your authentic voice. Because I think this is another another really imp important point is is finding your authentic your being your authentic self, finding your authentic voice. Because I do come across people occasionally where I can just tell that they've decided, okay, I'm going to be maybe I'm going to swear because I'm going to be really edgy, right? And you're just going, well, it just doesn't come off very well. You know, it just, it doesn't suit you. So, I mean, I think finding your authentic voice is very, is very important. That's one of the hardest things, especially with pressure on being like other people. Um, I remember seeing a friend's brother who was following Gary Vaynerchuk and he was sort of just imitating him, but it felt very off, like what you said. Yeah. 
So in being able to settle into who you are really takes a lot of internal confidence and internal yeah. centering to be okay with it for one thing, and then to find things that you really like about yourself that are unique and keep your quirks and keep the true you, which is not necessarily easy. You see someone else and, and you maybe think of them as a model, but we have something, and I don't know if you have this in Taekwondo, but in Aikido, we have something called steal the technique. So instead of trying to uh, be jealous of that person or, or, or take that on, we look at like, what is that person doing well? And how can I modify that and make it my own and make it mm -hmm. my technique? Because, you know, I'm 5'2". I don't know how tall you are, but you're probably a lot taller than I am. I'm so <laughs> but you're six one. So what's going to work for you at six one is not going to work for me at five two. Mm -hmm. Um, in Aikido, Taekwondo, neither. Like your kick yeah. range, my kick range, like I'm not <laughs> even gonna be able to right reach anybody's head with my leg if you're six two, if I were doing Taekwondo. So I'm taking that in and saying, what can I learn from this and how can I make it mine would be a more productive question. Yeah, yeah. And I and I think that I think that's so important, uh, making it yours rather than just being, uh, I think, as, as my as my compatriot, uh, Oscar Wilde said, you know, uh, be yourself because everybody else is taken. My favorite. Uh, saying. I always think that that's, favorite. yeah, I think it's such a such yeah. such a great saying. So I think I think that's an important part before you ever embark on it is trying to find like your own voice, your, how comfortable you are, like not everybody has to be gregarious. Some of the most interesting people you come across is just are very knowledgeable and very passionate about what they do, but in a quietly confident way. And they're completely enthralling. And sometimes the people who are like, you're going like, could you calm down a wee bit? <laughs> right. I think that's so true. And there's actually now statistics and neuroscience for it was um, Adam Grant, who who was talking about when people are pitching investors, the ones who got the funding were not the ones who were super passionate and super happy. They were not taken as seriously. The ones who were more thoughtful and quiet, but also, you know, of course they had all of their ducks mm -hmm. in the row, got much more funding more often. So people are always talking to us about be extroverted, be passionate, be, but, but evidence shows the opposite in terms of if you want to be taken seriously and you want to grow your grow yourself there's there's room for everyone there's room for mm -hmm. every type of person and i think the key thing is that you really develop that and continue continue to grow yourself in fact there's there's more science that shows that the number one um in successful leaders Cornell did this study that the number one quality was self-awareness. So part wow. of self-awareness is knowing how you connect and relate to other people. Yeah. Um, I, I honestly, I think self-awareness is the most important uh, mm -hmm. factor in personal and professional success in any, in any area. It's a difficult thing to achieve sometimes. And, uh, and I think we would all, I mean, I can only speak personally. I wish I had gone on a journey of self-awareness a lot earlier in my life. But hey, <laughs> Don't better we all? Late, better <laughs> late than never. Um, but yeah, I would totally agree yeah. with you. I think on if, if, you're, if you lack self-awareness, then if you start to put yourself out on these platforms, right, on, on media, on podcasts or whatever, uh, if you're not self-aware, that could, that could be disastrous, right? Yeah, I was media training a woman who runs a $30 million company, and she was very assertive. She liked to think of herself as assertive. Some people would call her aggressive. And she was being very forceful, and yet turning her head to the side. Mm -hmm. And um, and we were talking about, should we do when you're in a conversation that was very sort of heated, do you want, why not to do like what we call in full a full stop, meaning stop the conversation or like more of a hammerhead, a pattern interrupt versus in Aikido, like go with the flow and redirect yeah. the conversation. So we went through three different scenarios. Here's how you, here's how the softest way is redirecting and moving to a topic that you want with a transition statement. The second part would maybe be a little bit harder. And the third was the hard stop, which might be something like, no, research shows and if she wanted to soften that, 
then the head would be to the side. But it's about being aware of your body, your face, your language, your vocal variation, as well as your gestures to know what kind of effect it has and what kind of effect you want. It's not right or wrong because she's like, what's wrong mm -hmm. with this? There's nothing wrong with it. It's what you want. Or do you want to soften the blow by turning your head to the side? Or do you want to give it full on direct where everything is in alignment? That's your choice, but it's a conscious choice, not something that you're not aware of. And that's part of physical self-awareness as well as internal awareness or energetic awareness, right? Like how forceful or how quiet you want your voice to be, the breath, the body, the whole being of you, the whole energetic read of you that someone's getting. Yeah, I mean, I, I I totally agree with that. And I think it's it's very interesting because to your point is you will you will get a physiological reaction you know your body your body will often tell you you know if you're in a situation and you're maybe you're in an interview and it is getting contentious and you are feeling like it's getting out of control your body's going to start telling you that because you're going to start getting very tense uh you're going to so so i think that whole thing of being in tune also with the messages your body's sending is a good thing too it is. And that's part of that's part of the practice is being put under pressure mm -hmm. to and, and it's not only time pressure, but it's also pressure of being asked. Oftentimes what we do is we practice worst case scenarios and that's so you can be comfortable because if the worst has already happened, then what it actually does, it's actually easy, you mm -hmm. know, so it's and, and that can be forceful or aggressive questions. It can be more intimate, quiet questions. So women tend to get some of the more intimate things that are maybe inappropriate. And men might get more. It, it works both ways. I mean, anyone mm -hmm. can get any of those kinds of questions, invasive or um, inappropriate questions. But it's great to practice all of those and figure out what your trigger points are. What's going to get under your skin? What tweaks you. And the more you know what that is, the more then you can practice that and get that into, I just read another fascinating statistic too, that if you incorporate, if it takes like, it takes 400 repetitions to get into to a new skill, not that I, I think Malcolm Gladwell is at 10,000, but that's for mastery, right? <laughs> So, but if you incorporate play, like make it fun, which is what, what I do oftentimes with my clients, it's like, right. you know, I'm going to shout at you now. And so, and they're like, ah, you know, and, but we do make it fun. And what I, what I just read is that if you make it fun, then this, the repetitions go down to 10 to 20 from oh. that 100. I know. So I thought, so, so it won't take you long to get that skill set unless it's like a deeply ingrained issue or trigger, right? Yeah. But if it's just something that takes, you know, difficult situations, then it can change really super quickly. Yeah. And there's an interesting also, there's an interesting psychological thing as well, is that our, our brain, um, if we do simulations or role plays, our, our brain remembers those as actual, a, a real. They yes. don't distinguish. And therefore, yeah, you know, your yeah, point... Either. Yeah. yeah, to your point, like, you know, practicing and role playing is really good because you may say, OK, well, but that's just practice. Now I'm in the real thing. Say, no, your your practice and the, and the role plays and everything you do, it gives you something to fall back on. It really is. And that's why we do super realistic ones, because when you're in that situation, then it's, it's like you have done it and you're yeah. used to it. And the other thing is that your body is used to it because it's not just mental. You know, it is your physicality, like what you said, like, you know, when you're in a nervous situation or something, you know, you and then and you mm -hmm. don't breathe. And we both know this from the martial arts mat, too. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> I know like some of the guys in there, like there was one guy who was like almost seven feet. He was like six, nine coming at me with like a bokeh to the head. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to hold your ground, but not after the 10th time. Yeah, exactly. You know, after the 10th time of him coming and screaming at me with a bokeh, and I'm like, Okay, so he's a big guy, right? You know, uh, harder they, harder uh, they, yeah, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. The harder they fall, yeah. yeah. Um, and just, just one other question I wanted to ask you as well is, uh, so how do you help people who maybe for the first time or, or when they end up in a situation where maybe they're asked something contentious, maybe they're asked something they're not sure about, maybe they misspeak 
their answer and they're like, no, oh shoot, that's not what I meant to say. So how, how do you help people prepare for things like that so they don't misstep? That's such a huge thing because in today's culture, you can't take anything back. And with cancel mm-hmm. culture now too, which we just saw with Kanye West, right? And we saw with the Will Smith slap, nobody remembers Will Smith's reputation now. They only remember that mm-hmm. one act, right? So you can never, ever take that back. You can't take your actions back. You can't take your words back. So that's why it's so important to practice those things. So the first thing to do is, you know, in terms of the Will Smith case, would have been to take some breaths. Mm. When you feel the the energy coming up to your head and the aggressive energy, it's to feel, to put your energy all the way into the ground and take that breath. So that is something that you can practice and that we do practice quite a lot off camera. So when you're on camera, again, that that is ingrained in your muscle and mental memory. So the breathing is the most important thing because when we're nervous too, we start to breathe more shallow and things like that. So the box breathing, which is um, just four in, breathing in for four, Mm -hmm. hold for four and out for four is something that you can practice in less, probably about two to four minutes, your autonomic nervous system will calm down. So when you're in the moment, you can just, even taking that one breath, nobody's going to notice that you're taking that breath. And the second Mm -hmm. thing is... So that's the that's the practice of the breath. The second thing is an on the spot moment is to have transition statements so you can buy time and transition to the information that you want. And it can be anything that buys you time. A super easy one that I've heard a lot of people use, but you can only use it once, is say, that's a great question or a variation. That's an interesting question. Or I just heard what was on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Um, he said, that's a personal question that I don't think I'm going to answer, you know, so you can use humor. Oh, with that's that. good. Yeah, I thought I thought, oh, that's a new one for the repertoire. That's a very personal question that I'm never going to answer. And it's <laughs> funny, right? And mm-hmm. so that kind of statement about acknowledging it and then transitioning to the information that you want someone to know. And that's the key is to move instantly to that information because you can never buy your reputation back. Yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. No, I think that's great. I I am always tempted to be honest when people when I ask a question, people go, "That's a great question." And I'm always tempted to go, "So what? The other ones weren't very good." <laughs> <laughs> it's a buy time thing, but keep I know, I know, I know. For rapport. I don't recommend they do it rapport. I say use that as a rescue question. Yeah, and yeah. and I think as well, and I think as well, it's also kind of a judgment. So you could say. That's a fascinating way to think about something, you know, <laughs> so that might be a more interesting variation, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, and I think the other thing, too, is uh, I think you should always feel uh, it doesn't matter how big the interviewer is or how big the, you should always feel that you have the right to go. Um, can I just go back on to what I just said? I just want to clarify. I'm not sure I explained it exactly the way I want to do or whatever, rather than just let it go and then later on go, oh, oh my goodness. That, John. That's so great. One thing you can do if it's edited is just say rather, because that, that's a mm-hmm. cue to the editor that they need to to do another take. But if it's in but if it is in person and you don't want you say what I really wanted to say is, or what I wish I had just said was, mm-hmm. or let me clarify what I said, because this is what I meant. You can always do that. And I love that you said, don't feel like you can't do that because you're the only one who's in charge of yourself, your yeah. own reputation, your own actions, mastering yourself is the only thing you can do. You're not ever controlling the other person. And it's a big job to control yourself. As we know, mm-hmm. it's not, and it's not easy. So that's a, that's a great reminder that, um, mm-hmm. that most of the time you can make a save. Yeah. And, and just the last point is, is a, again, is don't look at it as if, oh, well, they're doing me a favor. No, it's a mutual, it's a peer to peer thing. They, they, you've got something interesting to say. They want to, to share that with their audience. So I, I think you should always go in on a level playing field. I like that you mentioned the mindset because I think that's super important is that that is a mindset that you want before you go into the interview is that what I have to convey is a value 
to my audience and I'm secure in that. And I'm, even if you're not secure in yourself, which a lot of, we, none of us, I mean, I don't know what that means, but we're all on the path to yes. secure, a certain semblance of security at one time. But to be, I think it's, it's not about being securing yourself. It's about that being centered in knowing who you are and having the best of intentions that people really feel that about you when yeah. you have the best of intentions. And then when you make a mistake or you muff something, then you, then you're forgiven. Yeah. Right. Cause and people are really on your side. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's, that's the other thing. I think uh, just as we come to finish, it's like when you speak live in front of people, um, I always say to people who are nervous ago, everybody in the audience wants you to do well. Everybody wants you to be interested. Everybody wants you. Nobody wants to see somebody die on stage. I mean, it's, it's uncomfortable for you. It's uncomfortable for everybody else. So remember, they're on your side. And the same thing, I think, in, in situations like this where you're doing interviews or podcasts is, is you got to remember the other people, they're on your side because they want a good show. They want a good interview. So, um, you know, you should go in with that, with that in mind. They, they do. People are good at heart. And, mm -hmm. and and they do want the best for you and you want the best for them. And I think it's a mutual connective thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, this has been fantastic, Susan. All of Susan's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. So um, I am at PRSecrets.com and I wanted to offer all of your listeners, especially people who want to be on podcasts like this, I have a free report and it's the five ways to create your signature story, which is the story that everyone is going to ask you, why do you do what you do? And you can finish that in five minutes. And it's prsecrets.com forward slash sig pod, like signature story podcast. And that's available to all of you. And that way you can prepare much better for any kind of media interview and podcast. So for any of you who want to work directly with me, I love to work with people one-on-one -on -one to prepare you for podcasts or interviews. And also um, I am starting a group program mastermind, which will be yeah, very, it's going to be a small intimate group, but it will be a way to be in community. And we're going to do a quick start with that, which is seven weeks to get local and national TV. So we're going to do a super quick start in that mastermind. So whether it's group or in person, I would welcome working with you one-on-one -on -one to develop your presence, your command presence, and how to use media to grow your business and brand. Well, fantastic. And, and like I said, we'll include all of that uh, in the show notes. So um, thanks again, Susan. And thank you all for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon.